Middlecoff, we were trying to figure out the last time we talked to Greg, po- Greg Poppett, uh, it was in the bunker at a Giants game. You remember that yeah. day? That was the day Greg walked up to two security guards, said, hi, I'm Greg Papa," and the door to the Gotham Club just opened for us. I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's after, after we did the uh, – you guys said you got about a half hour for a podcast, and three days later we came out of the, uh, the KNVR bunker, and I wanted to show you around the ballpark. Yeah, I do love the Gotham Club. I, I love the, uh, the early 20th century speakeasy, which actually – a little, you know, going back to the Spanish flu and 100 years ago, the pandemic, right after that was prohibition in this country. So I certainly hope we're not going to go back to that. Uh, but that, that whole time when you go in the Gotham Club, there's two different Gotham Clubs. There's one down field level where you can walk out, and actually it's fantastic. You walk out right where, you know, Hunter Pence made the Pence and the Fence catches right there I showed you guys. And then there's a Gotham Club up higher, I forget what level, probably the third level I think it is, where they actually have a pool table and uh, a bunch of other items up there. So yeah, we went we went back to, uh, not quite to when they were called the New York Gothams, when they were born in 1883, but we went back to uh, the New York City Polo Grimes kind of vibe and did the speakeasy thing. That was fun. I, I think we're more likely to have another pandemic than have alcohol go away. So I think we're, I think we're good there. I think we got no, also, we got marijuana coming in as well. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be the opposite. I, I think uh, you're going to be a lot of drink and drive. No, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> but I think we, when we come out of this, I think we're going to, well, what alcohol sales are up like 46%. Oh, crushing it. During, so yeah. So yeah. loading the whole economy. It is, you know, do, do you, um, what do you miss right now? You miss OTAs, baseball games? Yeah, I don't, honestly, I, I mean, yeah, uh, it's what I do, but I don't, I don't think now's the time for it, to be honest with you. I don't, uh, you know, I, what I miss is being able to see my mother. My mom turns 91 on June the 4th and she's got an existing uh, issue breathing. She's on a, a ventilator at night and an inhaler. So I, I took two, two weeks and two days off. My intent was to go back and see her. And she rightfully, correctly won't let me in her home because uh, I don't want to uh, give her the virus. So. Uh, I, I'm not like other people. I'm, I'm able to hold down and, and do this for a long haul. I don't think I've left my house for, I think it's 10 weeks now, maybe 11. Uh, honestly, since March, I mean, I left my house here and there, but really I haven't, oh, I I haven't really interacted with people. I mean, to go to the supermarket a little bit, but no more than a handful of times. Uh, actually went to downtown Danville last night because it was so hot and just wanted to get a vibe of what was going on and it's like the neutron neutron bomb exploded and where are all the people go the buildings are all here but i don't see any civilization it's this is by far the most uh interesting is just one word to use um traumatic important situation in our lifetimes i don't think we'll ever experience we've never experienced anything like this since and hopefully we never will again so I, i'm not like most people i, I have to have it. I think it needs to come back appropriately. I'm not sure we can play a major league baseball season. Uh, I think basketball is going to try it with their bubble and the NHL as well. I don't know how the NFL is going to be able to get through this without, without question. We're going to have isolated, uh, you know, isolated cases. Are we going to have an outbreak where an entire position group gets it? Then what do you do? And when you look at nursing homes, you look at penitentiaries, you look at ships. I mean, whenever people are in a closed environment, it just spreads or everybody gets it. So it spreads as readily as the flu, but the mortality rate is way higher. You know, it could be one to one and a half percent. So um, I don't, I really don't miss it, honestly, because I don't think it's the time for it. This is not like 9 11, it's not like World War II, where in 9 11, we're a little worried about uh, terrorism. But I wasn't. I mean, if, if I die, then I die. I go to work, then, you know, I'm not, I'm not infringing on John and Guy's rights. But if I go out and mix around and then we come together and I give you the disease and you take it home to your mother, or, you know, it all, it's based on a lot of different factors, H2 tracers in your body and vitamin D, even though you're both young and healthy, who knows how you're going to recover. So, uh, no, I don't, I personally don't miss it in that sense because I just don't think it's appropriate time for it to come back. I, when I see the death toll rising to 100,000 in this country alone, I don't, 
I don't miss it. But I, I mean, as far as the sports world, I have been, uh, I, I've been doing this my whole life anyway. Not my whole life, but since uh, whatever I get my hands on it, YouTube is great, is to go back and watch old games. Uh, I love doing that. I, I do that uh, even during the season, but I always get pried away from a game that I have to watch to get ready for my next assignment. But I would far prefer to watch, you know, Sandy Koufax's performance against the Minnesota Twins in 65. I watched that. I watched Don Larson's perfect game. And the difference uh, today is they're broadcasting it on, you know, the MLB network. I watched the Knicks-Lakers game. Uh, Willis Reed's famous game seven. I've watched it several times on YouTube, but the quality on the NBA channel to be able to watch it and just how great of a game Walt Frazier had. I knew he had a great game. He had 19 assists on top of the 36, 38 points, whatever it was. So anyway, I, uh, I've i always kind of done that. And when I need to escape and get away from the harsh reality of what's going on in our world, I will go back and watch old games. But I, I just don't honestly think it's the time. Um, for us to come back yet. It's just too much pain and suffering going on in the world for, for things as trivial as sports to be back yet. It, it will come back. And I think it's some time we got to come out of our homes and do it appropriately. But I, sports is just a different, a different animal because you're bringing so many people together in a close quarters. I, I don't know how you do it safely. Well, that's why you could tell yesterday there was that report that they might try to get some mini camps in, <clears throat> in a couple weeks. Clearly, coaches were pissed. I read yesterday a lot of coaches had told their other assistant coaches, just plan as we're going to have nothing until training camp. You can't – the NFL, basketball, you could have a pickup practice tomorrow with 12 guys, right? Football, you could, do the rookies know what's going on? Do the other positions, the new guys know what's – it's a little more complicated. You got new coaches. Like, you go to an OTA practice, there are a lot of moving parts out there, right? You know, you yeah. can't really go on the fly. Yeah, and I, I – you know – and I think it has to be equitable for everybody. You know, if a few teams are opening up their facilities and no coaches are, are back. So a little bit has been overplayed in the media and rehabbing players have been allowed to come back before. So but, Kyle's in the office right now is what you're saying? No, no, he's not. I don't, no, yeah. they, they have not opened up 49, 49. Oh yeah. Levi's. They're not doing that. And so everybody can go back as one. Then I don't think it should be allowed. I mean, you have I agree to, with you level of a playing field as possible. Uh, and I well, look at what Sean Payton did with the Saints. He's not doing all the Zoom meetings. He said, just spend time with your family and we'll come back when it's appropriate. But when they do come back, I think the rules have to be changed. A lot of rules have to be changed. Uh, I think meeting time uh, in the Players Association is going to have to have to understand. You're going to have to make up for the on-field work and the teaching and I think they're able to do that effectively with, with Zoom. I, I, I'd be fascinated to learn exactly how it works. Like, I've got two screens going just talking to you guys. Uh, so, you know, as we're having this, this meeting right now, you know, do I need to, you know, I guess if you're in a meeting group, you know, Jimmy needs to see, uh, you know, when, the, when all the offensive players are together, Brandon and I, you could look them in the eyes and talk to them. He may be a better learner. If you know, and you may be more attentive in a meeting like now where in a regular meeting, if I'm sitting in the back of the room, I could be back and just like, but if I'm on a you know a screen, it's like, Papa, wake up. What the Christ are you doing? But you could be watching so, Netflix right now for all we know. I could be, or I, I could be from a teaching standpoint, I'm watching other, you know, television shows right now. Uh, but you know, I could be looking at video. So you're right. saying, you know, this, this pinwheel, you know, screen we ran against Arizona, this is the way it works, uh, Brandon, this is the way we ran this. So, you know, I, I'd be fascinated to, to know how they learn, how many different screens they have up at one time to watch video, and then to conduct a meeting like this. But getting back to when we do come back in July, I think you're going to have to make up for lost time, both on the practice field and in the classroom. So I think uh, th there's going to have to be adjustments made to time on the field, not necessarily on the practice field working yeah. out, but I think the walkthroughs, you, ha you have to have – everybody's attention to get the quality of play uh, and then conversely I, I don't know what they're going to do with rosters this year uh, I, I don't know if we need to cut as much as we have in the past I know they've expanded rosters a couple of spots and a couple of game day openings I think it needs to be more widespread uh, I, I would almost think do we need to cut maybe not 90 guys but maybe we should keep 80 or 75 and, I, you know, as far as IR this year, and I know they want to expand. Uh, and I don't know why you can't bring guys back anyway if they go on IR. 
I know, you know, people do try to stash guys for that. They've expanded it from one recall to two. Now they're talking about three. I think you've got to look at a baseball type of COVID list. If somebody tests positive, we need to quarantine them for 14, 15 days. He needs to go on the COVID list, whatever you want to call it. And then we're not going to lose a roster spot. Why would we do that? We're going to need them. You know, what? how many quarterbacks are we going to take? You know, what if, uh, you know, two quarterbacks, what if the whole quarterback room comes down with it? You know, I mean, these are unfair. These are unforeseen, but you have to see them because they look at if we're in situations where people are closely together. You know, will they wear masks after they quarantine and they come back? Are they going to wear masks in, in meeting rooms? I don't know. Well, when people do interact, whether it's a nursing home, a penitentiary, uh, a cruise ship, you know, anything where people are tightly, it spreads, you know, like half the people, 60% of the people get it. So what are you going to do then? So, yeah, I think as far as OTAs and on the field, I'm not looking for any of that to return to July. Look at the NHL. The NHL came back, and I think that their, I think their proposal is interesting on a lot of levels. Uh, and I, I think it appeases the we didn't get to finish our year argument. You know, why can't we make the playoffs? But they talked about anything on, on ice is not going to happen at all until early July. So if they're talking about baseball coming back, Hell, it's June 1st, Monday. You know, we're going to come back and start the season July 4th. Hockey's not doing that. They're talking about training camp, getting on the ice in early July. So it's more the NFL and what the NBA is looking at, which is late July to return to play, you know, bring our guys back in phases. Uh, so I don't think the NFL is going to be in any position to do that meaningfully. So it's a lot of chatter to get it done in June. I think the calendar is really going to be July. And then when we do come back, how do we change the rules to understand the reality of this world we're moving into now? What was it like with the um, – I know it's not the same thing, and we've had an NFL abbreviated camp, um, Harbaugh's first year, but, but for the NBA in 99, you were with the Spurs that year, right? And that, that season didn't yeah. start till early February. How much lead-up time did they give teams? What was the early – what would the, those early games look like? Were guys in shape? Yeah, but it was, uh, I don't, you know, honestly, I, I, you know, I was doing KNBR radio. I was doing Gary Radish's show during that time. And then we did uh, come back, uh, I want to say right around Groundhog's Day, and we played 50 games in 80 days. And uh, I don't remember exactly how much training camp. I think there was a couple of weeks' time. But um, they, you know, the schedule changed. We, we played three days and three nights in three different cities. I'm not going to say a lot, but I think we did it two or three times. We played not only five games and seven nights. They played six and eight. They had to. I think it was 50 games and 80 uh, some odd days. So you had to get it in to have a meaningful season before you began the playoffs. But I thought the quality was good. Um, even going back to that 2011 year, the NFL's, that was a, that was a labor lockout. So that's entirely different. So you did have, you know, the players weren't allowed in the facilities. You were locking them out. But they did get together. I remember Alex Smith got everybody together. Wasn't that when Crabtree got hurt during that famous time uh, when he had the workout at San Jose State? I, th been. I thought he got hurt at an OTA practice, but I guess they wouldn't have had OTAs. I, I think it was the next year. It was the next – because that was Harbaugh's first year. It was the Super Bowl year Crabtree got hurt. Yeah, Uh Whatever it was, there, but they did have organized throwing at that time. But that was the year that the Colts and, and, and Saints played in the, in the Super Bowl. And I thought that, that was going to be a real shift to the mentality of – because those were throwing teams. Even though, uh, you know, clearly uh, Sean Payton always likes to run and when his teams are balanced or the best. But that was a precision uh, – uh, the artistry of throwing the football. So I was amazed that year how strong the, the ability to, to, you know, when you're talking, I, I think the running game is more physicality. And uh, I think you can get back up to speed with that uh, in a training camp, even though the way the 49ers run the ball, it is timing and precision and landmarks and a lot more going on than ever before. Throwing the football and those drills, uh, you would think would suffer if you're not on the field working out with guy. That's what's going on right now. Now you're hearing about Brady getting together with his guys. And I think Garoppolo reached out to his guys to get together and throw. 
But that year blew me away with how precise and how on point passing game was in the NFL. I thought, wow, hey, this almost leads to we don't need OTAs and all this offseason stuff, mini camps. These guys are on point as much as they've ever had. So that year, now different circumstances, obviously, but I was I was impressed with how the passing game did not fall off. I thought it was right where it was and was starting to reach a level that was the highest I'd ever seen in the history of football. So I, I you know, to your point, guy, I'm not sure, but I, I think these guys will be able to pick it up reasonably quickly. You know, I, I think sports like basketball, because the nature uh, how many guys have a home gym in their, in, you know, at their residence? Not very many. Even Steph Curry uh, didn't have one. How many do? How many are living in a high-rise building where they can't have access to a court? I mean, you couldn't go shoot in the playground at all. So teams in the Midwest with cheaper real estate will, will have players better prepared? Uh, depends on where you're living. But, I, you know, even at some point, uh, everybody had to shut it down to some degree. So, I, you know, I, the point is, you know, I think some of these guys went the longest they've ever gone since they were old enough to hold a basketball without shooting one. So, I, you know, some of that skill may erode, but I think they're getting back into it. But I, I don't know. I mean, to answer your question, uh, I don't know how these sports, if we're going to have uh, a, a drop-off in the quality of play based on the fact that they've, they've had to shut it down to some degree or be more creative in how they've trained. I wonder about – the strength of linemen in the NFL. We were talking to Javon Kinlaw right after he got drafted by the 49ers, and he said he's able to do some cardio, but he has no access to weights. So, and I'm sure the 49ers' strength of the performance staff is, you know, since he's been drafted, gotten him on board. But I, if you don't have access to weights, you can't go to a gym. You know, you can't – everybody's not like Trent Williams where you own your own gym where he and Adrian Peterson do. I wonder if you will see some – when these guys do come back in, you see some body types like, wow, what happened to that guy? He's not nearly as, as built as he needs to be to play NFL football. I think it could hurt, hurt the rookies, but I think most guys that are a couple years into the league, they just have so much access and know guys and have ability to get into places even though they were closed down. But it's going to – college guys are screwed, right? I mean, a, a guy from Alabama that has to go home to Texas or Annie Ocker, I mean, that guy's in trouble. You know, you, you've been calling NFL games for over 20 years. Uh, this was your first year with the Niners. You've seen from John Gruden to every team that you guys played against with the Raiders for every – Mike Shanahan's to the Andy Reeds to the Sean Paytons to the Belichick's to – looking back, I know the Super Bowl, the ending was shitty, but the overall season, is that as good of a coaching job and just a well-run operation as you've seen? Yeah, but it, when you go back to what you said, it's the best uh, – it's the, the most perfect football season I've ever witnessed, really. I, I mean, when you, when you start the year, your goal is obviously to win every single game, but you're not required to do that to win the Super Bowl. But what you want to achieve is to be the number one seed. And uh, you, you need – the 49ers season was just perfectly executed – as anything has been uh, that I've ever been around. Now, there have been, obviously, New England 16-0 and year, and Indianapolis had one year where they started 13-0 and and shut it down at the end. Um, but, but as far as the whole thing, to come off a four-win year, and I wasn't there every day, but I did watch that team, obviously, very closely doing other responsibilities I have on radio and TV. I thought they would be good, but I didn't think they would be that good. Uh, I thought Bosa would be good. I didn't think he would be that good. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that pass rush dominated the league, the running game, with the exception of a couple of games. And there were obviously a strong, long stretch of the year where they lost the right tackle, the left tackle, and the fullback. And Kittle was gone yeah. for a while there. So, But they still, you know, they had to reinvent themselves some games and throw it more than they wanted to. But they still won. I mean, to go 8-0 and to, to do it all the way they did it, uh, I was with one Raiders team, obviously the team that went to the Super Bowl, where they did, they had the number one seed, uh, and they they did make it all the way to the Super Bowl. But the 49ers, the the ultimate uh, season would be to win as many games as you can win, and have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. And then, but the two playoff games they played oh. were as almost as perfect as you could possibly play 
I mean, the Viking game, when Stefan Diggs did, you know, get behind a Keller Witherspoon and score. And Jimmy, Jimmy, threw, the, threw, Jimmy threw the pick the right pick before the half. For yeah. a couple of moments, but I never thought they were going to lose. I thought, you know, they may not beat them 49 to nothing, but they're, they were always the dominant team. So those two in the Packer game, they were the – this rolled them. So as far as your fan base, you're not going to have a home playoff, a home Super Bowl. Now, Tampa May this year, but the final game is not going to be in your home stadium. To have two playoff games be just rollicking routes the way they were is just as special as you could possibly have. So, and even when they lost throughout the regular season, there were never – the three games they lost, they lost on the last play of the game, essentially. I mean, so it was never like they got routed this game. They weren't ready to play. They lost three times, but did they? I didn't. I never felt like anybody was. I never left any of those games. At Baltimore, certainly Seattle, Atlanta was Atlanta. I never left the stadium thinking they're better than the 49ers. Not one time. So, uh, in fact, I felt the opposite. I felt Baltimore. If we play them in the Super Bowl, we'll beat them. Uh, I felt that all the way. I felt they were better than Seattle. So, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've seen, you know, Gruden's team host the AFC championship game and, uh, you know, some special Raider years, the, the Super Bowl game. Uh, but as far as from the, you know, the entirety of the season, including the preseason, because they won three out of four in the preseason, not that it matters, but it, it showed the depth of the team that they were, they were behind, I think, in all, all three of those games at, at halftime. Uh, but they, they wore the team down in the second half, which shows your team. And you're yeah. going to need the depth because you're going to lose. They had a lot of injuries they had to overcome to significant people. Um, so, yeah, it was it was an extraordinary season from start to finish. And then including the Super Bowl. Uh, Kansas City, and we talked about it. I was I was fearful of Kansas City all year. I just I, – I felt like that was the only team that I thought – I'm not sure the 49ers – I know they can beat them, but you, will they beat them when it's required to beat them? And uh, everybody else I felt they could beat. Kansas City was, yeah, I think the 49ers can beat Kansas City, but I think Kansas City could beat the 49ers. And the way the Super Bowl played out was all of those different games that I saw where they could dominate, but there were going to be times where you just couldn't deal with that guy and his stable of speed. And Andy and the way he runs the whole thing, the tight end, the backs, everything. And uh, so, you know, you got right there to seven minutes and 13 seconds away from winning the thing. And then that other side kicked in, which made it. That's why this season is so hard for me to look back on. And I'm, you know, to some degree, the pandemic, you don't even worry about it anymore. Yeah. And you know, part of me wonders, uh, and obviously, you know, so many people have lost their lives. There's a bigger issue here. But the Chiefs cannot fully celebrate their championship uh i'm sure they're going to pass out super bowl rings and but how are they going to have a ring presentation are they going to, they going to wait to do that during the year uh you're going to do it on a zoom call you know i don't know i mean it's just not the same yeah so it's kind of, it's kind of a you know this you don't want this distraction obviously but uh, i think the, the the this time of the year would have been how are they overcoming the loss well, they're overcoming the loss because football is not important right now. And that, that game seems like 20 years ago. So, um, but yeah, they, you know, that, that was a perfect, it was the, the most perfect season with the most imperfect ending to yeah. a season. They, they, it was, the whole thing went perfect. It just was just absolute perfection until that third and fifteen. And two, three, chip, jet, wasp, whatever the hell that place called, <laughs> where the whole thing just began to flip, and then there was an avalanche on it. I think, you know, part of that Super Bowl, John and I have talked about this a lot, part of what made the year impressive, too, was seeing Kyle Shanahan kind of become fully actualized or at least have the results that we thought. It wasn't just that they had a great year. It was toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sean Payton in an epic game, toe-to-toe -to -toe with Andy Reid in the Super Bowl. And one thing Middlecoff and I have talked about a few times, I thought one of the most illuminating things I heard from Kyle Shanahan this year was on a pregame interview with you talking about how he scripts plays and not just that he scripts great plays, right? But he, so he has the IQ to script the plays, but the EQ to, under, to realize what's happening in his locker room, recognize he has to have 
the play script 50-50 run and pass because if it's 75% pass, then the running backs start moping before the game. Well, we're not going to run the ball today and vice versa. Right. What was yeah. it like for you spending the whole year with him? What, what did you come out of the year thinking specifically about Kyle? Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by him. Uh, to the same level, probably being around a young John Gruden when I saw John and, and what he was doing creatively. And to another extent, being around, uh, you know, he was older than John, but a young Bill Callahan and what he meant to the running game. And just being around great offensive minds, Tom Cable, uh, an offensive line play, uh, and other coaches. But with Kyle, I mean, you're talking about Mike Shanahan's father, first of all. So, uh, you know, he's in diapers learning about how to run the outside zone stretch run game and all the movement, everything around it. So, uh, and then have him be at this stage of his career, a young guy, very much a guy's guy, and you can approach him. Uh, I love the interviews I did with him and I couldn't do them all because of my other responsibilities, but I interviewed him on, on television uh, for 15, 20 minutes on Thursdays when I could. And then we'd play a chunk of that on the radio pregame show. Uh, it was challenging uh, because like when I interviewed Gruden, it was right before the game and the early years, it would be the Saturday night before the game. Uh, and then we'd spend you know, hour or two together just talking. Uh, but then later on, it was right before the game. And it was when he was really relaxed. It was time to go now. Everything's done. All the maniacal preparation is done. And now it's just that two-hour window. Uh, and we would talk, you know, for a half hour, 45 minutes, right leading up to when the officials would come in for that meeting. And he, I would hang in the meeting with him a lot for those. And, but John was completely relaxed. And he, was, he would open up now, uh, where Kyle, it was because it was earlier in the week, he was still in that game prep mode. And also because the nature of the interview was going to be played on TV the night before, it's quite possible uh, that the opposing coach is going to sit in his hotel room and watch this interview. Or in the world we live in, it's going to go out on Twitter and someone. So it was uh, with John, I could craft the interview not as concerned, but obviously it's Al Davis's Raiders, so you're very concerned about giving away state secrets, but not as concerned back then. With Kyle, it was how can I, how could I ask a question that would elicit a response to be able to, to get uh, consumable information from one of the great football minds of offensive football? And what makes Kyle so good is he he is crafting offensive football to decode defensive football, which he's also taken the time to learn. So he knows all the basic principles of what they're trying to do on that side. So how do I get them into a compromising position, which is the both sides of the ball. So it's not just offense. So it's a full football genius mentality um, from a second generation football coach. He grew up around it. He didn't learn it necessarily the way other coaches have learned it. He learned it, you know, uh, it, by crayons as a kid, you know, around his house. So it was so, how could I give that? So that was a ch challenge every week. But the interview you're talking about was what, probably the best moment we've had. And I remember you texting me right after that. And it was, how do I engage him in a broad-based macro way enough that's not specific where it could be used against him, but in a, in a micro inside mentality way where he's willing to divulge this because it's not game plan specific. And that was it. And I forget it came up because the 49ers were so good coming out of halftime of games. They had a streak there early middle of the year where they scored at a very high percentage of the time, that first possession of the second half. And the thought was we've heard about coaches scripting, plays to start do you script plays to start the second half and then he got into it yes how many eight how's the eight broken down four offense four defense and then well do you script plays to open games yes you know bill walsh it was the 15 and the openers and uh he did that to start but as your point was 15 is an odd number 
So if you're going to come up with 15, you're going to have an imbalance between off between run and pass. So the players are going to let, what, are going to run the ball more this week, coach? No, we're not going to run it more. So let's do 16. And then I think he got to 24. So the bottom line is he does script two dozen plays for each game, 12 runs, 12 passes. He may not call them that way, but it's perfect balance. And then the same to start the second half. So nobody in the meeting room would think this is more of a, because we're not going to do that. You know, like the Minnesota playoff game, the Green Bay playoff game. You think they went into the game thinking we're going to run it? I forget how, what percentage of time it was, but it was ridiculous. Well, we're going to, if they can't stop the run, we'll run it every play until they can stop it. And the Green Bay game, they weren't getting four and six. They were getting most of touchdowns, play after play. And they're like, wow. And that one third and long when they ran it, most of went it untouched. So that's what a great coach is. That's Don Shula, you know, running it heavy when he had Zonka, Kick, and Morris. And then when he had Marino and, you know, the, 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 the Marx brothers, he changed. That's, that's what coaching is. So that's was able to go into it. But that's, you know, yeah, it was great being around Kyle and being around his mind and observing him and how he does things and even his quirkiness. And, uh, you know, the, the, when, as a football coach, you want things to be meticulous, whether you're playing on a Thursday night or a Monday night or a Sunday night or a Sunday at 1 o'clock or whatever it is. There's a mentality and a process to getting to that kickoff time. And you can't, you can't, it's like Greg Popovich. Pop always said, you can't cut steps. You can't, you can't not do this or you're, it's going to show up in a game. And, and the second week of the year, you're going to lose a game because you're trying to cut a corner. You cannot cut a corner. You got to, you got to build the team up through fundamentals and it's the same way to prepare. So yeah, it was fascinating to be around Kyle uh, knowing what his dad did and observing his dad for so long and then watch him, how he prepares, how he calls a game, how he sets up plays, and ultimately the evolution and the, the sophistication of the way his father and Alec Gibbs and uh, the Raiders of the late 80s, the, you know, the 49ers of the 90s, the Broncos of the 90s and 2000s ran the ball and the way he took that fundamental foundation of his father's concepts and modernized it to what we're seeing today from this offense. Well, what about the guy on the other side of the ball? Because I think the first couple of years, not that many people talked about Robert Sala. If anything, he was kind of taking some shit. And last year, he went from the guy that everyone wanted to interview. And it's pretty clear on paper, their defense is going to be pretty good again. And we did something a couple days yesterday on Robert Sala. Is he a lock to become a head coach next year? And it feels like he's got a lot of momentum coming into the season. We'll see a lot of variables. You never know what jobs, and he's on the maybe on the wrong side of the ball. But just being around him, I know your partner Tim Ryan's close buddy with him. What, what you think about yeah. Robert Sala? What you thought about him going in, and then a year around him? What you think? Well, I, I thought he was uh, unjustly criticized because there was a lack of talent, there yeah. was a lack of a pass rush, and that exposed the secondary. But um, they do believe in this cover three system, and Kyle believes in it. And that's the one thing I wanted to get into with Kyle to more, uh, and hopefully this season we'll get into it more, is just why he so firmly believes that's the way to play defensive football. You're not going to play every snap that way, but it, they, they play a lot of snaps with that basic shell. Uh, and, you know, he was around uh, Tampa Bay and John and Monty Kiffin and the cover two, and I think the cover three is an evolution of that. But they, they firmly believe when Kyle picked what defense he wanted to run, that's what he chose. And as an offensive play caller, that defense probably gives him trouble. There's, there's concepts and fundamental guidelines they have to adhere to. So I thought Sala was basically executing a defensive philosophy that is a proven winner in the NFL. We saw it with Seattle and what they were able to do. Now, there are rules in that defense that can be exploited. Like in a cover Lost. three, the weak side linebacker's got to take number three when you go to a three-by-one formation and that slot corner. And I saw teams pick on the 49ers repeatedly, not last year, but years past, where uh, whether it was Reuben Foster or some other weak side linebacker has to cover a slot receiver. And like, can you get out of that concept? That does not work. And they got trapped a couple of times. And they, you know, in the Super Bowl, when it was two, three, chip, jet, wasp, 
what was that? That was we're attacking the concept, and we're gonna we're gonna put a player in a crisis position here. And I, I you know, Manuel Mosley got caught, but I don't, you know, maybe how do you, how do you blame he, him? He thinks you're gonna throw it at the I sticks. He breaks up. I mean, it's I hard. I, I think that's instincts. I mean, good offensive play calling puts defensive uh, individuals into a crisis where they have to make a decision. Yeah, and uh, it may. It may seem like the wrong one, and you're probably schooled, but when you're in the middle of the Super Bowl and you see Sammy Watkins going to that shallow area, what are you going to do? Just drop him and follow Tyreek? Well, you know, it, it, there's a moment where you're going to have to make a decision, and that's what that does. So but I think that's just the concept of a zone defense is we're, we're all moving together like an accordion. You know, we're all – you know, we're not – where Al Davis hated zone defense because he never wanted that, that crisis – he wanted, I'm, I'm guarding, I'm going to cover you and I'm on your ass and you're my man and that's it. Well, then there's ways to, you know, with chips and there's ways to rubs and, and bunches and we can, we can exploit that. But anyway, with Salah, I thought before I had to meet him and observe him closely, I thought he was a young coach who had a, had a concept of how he wanted to play and the numbers were awful because he did not have a pass rush. Well, you go out and you and you make a trade to get D Ford, and then you draft Nick Bosa. We solved that problem. We got <laughs> we got a state of the art pass rush, and he wasn't on the field enough at the time. And uh, and, and, Ar and Armstead was ready to get paid and ball out too. Armstead, Buckner and all of it. It all came yeah. together. Yes, without question. And then an occasional you know linebacker blitz or a cat blitz off the slot. Uh, and now Akella Witherspoon's a much better player. And uh, we got Richard Sherman in the second year off the Achilles. He's a much better player. We got Jimmy Ward, not in the hospital ward, but he's Jimmy <laughs> Ward. So now it all, you know, it all works together. So now you've got a concept. And then being around him, and because of my relationship, obviously, with Tim Ryan and Tim's close relationship with Robert Sala, they're buddies. They play golf all the time. I, I probably chatted with him more than any coach uh, because he's accessible at times, but he's a, He's the highest quality individual. He's not, uh, you know, he's a tough man. And ultimately, this is a force game and bringing Kacerik in and wide nine and, you know, hair on fire. And we're getting up the field. And it's football. But there's a, to your point about Salah as a head coach, you know, a lot of defensive coaches can't translate to head coaches like like Rex Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> I think Salah will, will, will be ama amazingly – poignant compassionate yeah i think you will and i think you know gary st jean uses the term when you're a, a coach or a gm you have to coach up to your owner and your gm and then you got to coach down to your players and your fan or your fan base so there's a lot of different uh people judge coaches by how they talk to the media like hardball i don't care but people do care and the owner cares and you can't necessarily talk to your uh, your players, like you talk to the owner, the owner's not going to tolerate that. You got to explain things differently to your owner. So I think Robert Sala, you know, when he does get this opportunity, hopefully the 49er defense will be as strong in 2020 as it was in 19, and he's still viewed as a hot commodity. Because I think it's hard for coaches, for owners, the people that make the hire, to differentiate. You know, defensive minds. It's easier to, to evaluate offensive guys. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I think he will be a guy who will be considered of that. But as far as watching him as a coordinator, he had better ingredients to work with. Now, and also I think that they they got away from – it wasn't all covered three snaps. Uh, they mixed in a lot more man. I think, you know, when it's third down and uh, three, maybe four or less, they, they played man defense on third. You can't play – a zone defense and retreat on that those situations. You got to stop the first down. So you got to play more man. So there were situations, and I think the stats back that up, uh, that he 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 varied things more. And I think they will vary things more this year and how they're going to use Jimmy Ward. So my opinion didn't change much of Salah. I thought he was an interesting guy, <clears throat> observing him before, and I, I that's even more so. I think he's uh, he's the kind of guy. Uh, He's more the CEO football coach kind of guy. I think he's uh, on every level. He would be impressive, not just 
you know, let's put on the tape and we're going to talk detailed football. Let's try to, you know, get after Solomon Thomas here and get him to unlock that ferocity in him. So there's all different elements. There's the, there's the challenging, you know, traditional defensive football coach. There's the cerebral, uh, what do they call him, Gandhi around the building. I mean, Tony Dungy, I, I call Tony Dungy Gandhi a lot because I think there's that, first of all, there's the likeness. And then there's the, the compassionate side where sometimes you have to appeal this to guys' manhood. But yeah. some of these guys are smart. It's like, why? Why would I do that? Why? It's not just, you have to do that, and that's the way we do it. Yeah. It's, well, why? Is that really effective, Coach? I mean, some of these guys are smart guys. And Dominic Sue has that dichotomy, uh, dichotomy in his brain where he's like this badass kicking guys on Thanksgiving morning. And what's wrong with this man? He's a savage. And then you listen to him speak and, you know, he's Warren Buffett. So you're <laughs> like, what's going on here? So, uh, I, you know, the a guy like Solomon Thomas, I think both sides of it, maybe Kacerik's ferocity and tenacity appeals to him. And then Robert Salas got, got that side as well, but he's also got a highly intellectual uh, thought process to appeal to, to different players. So I think he's got, he's got the whole package. There's no doubt he's got the whole package. You know, we've already seen the effect of success in drafting well in DeForest Buckner's departure. As teams get more, teams have success, their players are good, they get more expensive. And, you know, one of the things that obviously happens then is now it's on your quarterback to get better. That happened in Seattle where Russell Wilson kept getting better even as the roster got less talented. Do, do you view Jimmy Garoppolo? Like, how do you look at Jimmy? Is there another level to him this year in your mind? Yes, but going back to Wilson, that's true. And they, you know, they also lost Marshawn Lynch and his effectiveness, and there was more on him. But they have now won a Super Bowl with that model. They've gotten close, yeah. but the model that you know the, to pay that defense and to keep the Legion of Boom together and the pass rush, Averill and Bennett. That's, that's what won and dominated. So, yes, Russell's become a much better thrower of the ball, much better pocket quarterback, much better out-of-the-pocket quarterback. Uh, he has some deficiencies that you can exploit, but uh, he'll also exploit your strength. So he's a uh, – over time, I, I've learned to embrace him more. Initially, I was not a huge fan of his, but I think he has evolved in a way Kaepernick never did. Now, as far as Garoppolo – I think what he has to, to work on, the, the, the splash plays are there. The 49ers scored almost 30 points a game. And they had some pick sixes. The defense scored. But they, they scored almost 30 points a game. It's the second highest scoring offense in football. So people believe, you need, I think they, in our minds, we think if you're going to score, you've got to throw to score. Well, no. Uh, Baltimore was the highest scoring team in the NFL. They're a run-based team. So the two highest scoring teams in football were run-based teams. So now but Garoppolo's still going to contribute. And he contributes mightily in the run game because of his smarts. Alert, alert, alert. And where we're going with the run game. That's all on him there. So that's the Tom Brady part of it. But uh, there's a lot of splash plays. Jimmy threw for a high number of yards. His, his touchdowns were there. The team scored. Uh, what he's got to eliminate is the poor plays. So I think the good and the great are there. They have the high percentage of hitting the deep throw. The 49ers threw the ball deep the least amount of any team in the league, but he hit the highest percentage. Uh, I think his deep ball will improve this year. Uh, it's not as strong as other quarterbacks in the league. And it's not as strong as even other quarterbacks on the roster. When you watch practice and watch C.J. Beathard, he throws the ball as far as the ball in the air and the NFL film spiral. You're like, wow, look at that ball, sore. He throws that ball better than Jimmy. But Jimmy's coming off an ACL. So I think as time goes on, he'll throw that ball more frequently and hopefully hit on it as high of a percentage as he did, which was number one. Uh, but what he's got to eliminate is the, the interception. The where, where was that? What was that throw? Did he not see Luke Kuechly buzz in that linebacker level? We all saw it. If you're, if you're watching, if you're, you know, checking Carolina's defense, you're looking at Luke Kuechly. If you're checking Minnesota's defense, you got your eyes on Eric Kendricks. And it, how did you not see Eric Kendricks in the playoff game? So those, the interceptions have, have, have need to come down. 
Um, but I think that's a product of him still trying to make a play. I, you know, some of those interceptions are balls that hit receivers' hands. Yeah, they were a little high. So there's all that game. The interceptions, I think, need to be in single digits. Uh, I, I would tolerate, you know, nine, eight, seven. They don't have to be one, two, three, like some of these freakish numbers. Um, but what I what bothered me more were the fumbles. Uh, he had 10 fumbles last year. He lost five. And the, that is on him. He needs to secure the ball and not fumble the ball and not lose the ball. And some, especially with this defense, like Kyle said, you know, I, I was more conservative calling the game because my defense is so great. Let's just punt it back to him. We're going to get the ball back in, in four plays. Jimmy's got to think that way as well and secure the ball with two hands. When I look at the, the, the one sequence, the Seattle home game, 8-0, Veterans Day night, Monday night football, uh, you know, that they were controlling that game. And then he gets the strip sack, the scoop and the score, Clowney and Puna Ford. It happened again to start the second half, but I know the tackles were having a hard game coming back. Lynchy and Staley were just back, and it was on, they weren't on their, on their, their game that night. Uh, but he's got to hold the ball. So if you can take a sack, especially with this defense, don't fumble the ball to that team. So I think, I think the improvement in Jimmy's game is don't – the splash plays are there at a winning level, at a high-scoring level. Uh, continue to think that way. Interceptions, bring them down. And then fumbles, put, put two hands on the ball, take a sack, don't give the other team the ball. I know you were a big Jerry Judy guy, but if I would have told you on Thursday morning of the first round that when the dust settles, they're going to end up with Trent Williams, Javon Kinlaw, and Brandon Ayuk, would you, uh, would you have felt okay if not getting <laughs> yeah. Jerry Judy? Because they passed on let Judy. Me ask you, let me ask you, even at age, where is he, 31? If Trent Williams was in this draft, John, where would he have been chosen? Yeah, I mean, he yeah. would have been easily the first. Where would the tackle go? Four? He would have gone. Yeah. The Lions would have taken him at three. You know, maybe they would have taken Chase Young. You're right. I mean, I guess he's coming from the Redskins. Yeah, yeah he yeah, would have gone high. Have, he would have gone high. Fred, he is the, by far, the most talented lineman that's ever played for the 49ers. He's that good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's hard to compare him to Bob St. Clair and all that and Sapolo and the inside guys. But Joe is a great player. There's no, and I think after researching, because Mayoko and I did this ultimate 49er draft, I studied every lineman of the history of the franchise. Uh, I think Staley is uh, the best left tackle ever. You know, more than Len Rohde or Steve Wallace or uh, certainly Bubba Paris, whoever you want to name. Um, but Trent Williams is, is a freak uh, athletically. He is... I've got – you know that I get into these man crushes on guys. I am. I, this guy. Uh, I was going to take him in that 49er ultimate draft, <laughs> but he hadn't, he hadn't played a, He hadn't taken a snap yet. So I said, how do I pick a guy for an all-time 49er team? But he hasn't played yet. But he's that good. Yeah, so he's Trey great. Williams is just the whole package. He is – wow. To get what him for a third and a fifth round pick, you know, it's just stealing. And, and, if, and if you don't re-sign him, you're going to get a compensatory third back probably for him. So really it's a fit. And Washington messed that up. Uh, you know, I'm tight with Bruce Allen, obviously. And when the trade went down, I texted Bruce all that Saturday and went over the whole thing with him. And uh, it was, it was, a, it was a heist at the highest level, but there were circumstances they were able to prey on. But this guy, he's got the, sh the short area of foot movement of a corner, like a yeah, Darrell Reeve type player. He's got the power and punch of a nose tackle. And then he's got the athleticism of movement of a tight end. I mean, the guy is that good of a player. So when Trent Williams is a different guy. Uh, just keep him healthy. And he's going to – you can game plan. There are very few linemen you can game plan for. You can game plan for him. Washington ran this uh, stretch run right uh, slot uh, throwback left to Deshaun Jackson. Go back and watch where they had D-Jacks on this team. It's unbelievable. And I asked Williams about it, and Kyle ran it earlier, where they fake the stretch going one way, they throw back, and they Trent Williams is out in space. The a lead slot. blocker. Lead blocker. And you could do it with Debo or Ayuk, either yeah. one. So you've got a badass wide receiver that likes to block and wants to block, and you got 71 out in space. They're going to be like, 71's take the first guy he's going to go down because he's afraid of him. 
And at 71, he's got to get the next guy. And it's like, wow. It's unbelievable. So anyway, Trent Williams is a freak. Um, I, I like Javon Kinlaw a lot. Uh, I liked him even better than I think uh, Derek Brown. And I think Derek Brown's a special player. In the NFL, he could just be a dominant, dominant player. You know, is he a Ted Washington, a Sam Adams? Probably not as big, more athletic. But I saw Kinlaw be more disruptive. But I, I did love Judy. I thought Judy had a skill set that nobody else had in the draft. And very few people in the NFL today or the history of the NFL have. And that is precise, precise, uh, intricate dance step kind of, uh, you know, Isaac Bruce, uh, Paul Warfield, Jerry Rice. Just Marvin, Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison at the highest level, route running. But then and Ayuk, I kind of put him in a hopper with the other guys where his strength was run after catch, yards after catch, like a lot of guys are. And the whole, the whole draft, there was one guy after the other. You know, Mims, obviously, C.D. Lamb. They were all like, well, these guys are running backs playing wide receiver. And Jerry Judy is still a really good run after catch, but he's going he's gonna to get yards at the catch. You know, he's going to catch these. His route running is just, you put in with Kyle. But I think one thing we've identified with this head coach, Kyle Shanahan. He likes a specific type wide receiver. Man. They got to be tough. And yeah. Jerry Judy, the one thing, and I think we, you and I spoke a lot during the leading up to it, uh, I think the Amari Cooper comparison with Judy may have hurt him where – uh, he didn't want, he didn't want to, he didn't, he didn't block. You know, he would try to be like, he tried to screen you or, you know, Steph Curry's still a good screen setter and a great back pick setter. Steph's not a big guy. He's not going to set a screen like a big guy, but he knew how to do it. So I think Judy could have been taught to do it, but he's not going to, remember that block Pierre Garçon had a couple of years ago on a touchdown where he you yeah, know, blocked yeah. a guy like, all the way to the end zone. Jerry Judy's not doing that. Brandon Ayuk. He can do that. Debo Samuel can do that. So it's all part of the versatility and everybody's interchangeable. And so I, I see the value in Ayuk. I do. Um, I, I don't quite understand. Kyle said he, you know, he can run any uh, route. I think he, you know, obviously he knows wide receiver play much better than I. Uh, I think he, he's a better route runner than a lot of the other guys that I saw. He's not Jerry Judy. But he, uh, the one thing that I did – you know, Kyle said we could use him at X at Z, which is, you know, X is a split end position on the line. Z is the flanker, the move guy. And then F is the slot, the way they designate him. And it's just, we, we oversimplify most of the time. You know, they go bunch formation. They're all bunched together. Yeah. It's not always. The so good guys do it all. I mean, it doesn't even matter. You ask the X to move around. Yeah. But I, uh, when I, when I Herman Edwards, we, I interviewed him like twice after the 49ers drafted him. And I said, without you, you know, I, Kyle said he's an X to Z and I have to do it all. But I see him almost every single snap. There's a couple of times he went to the right and a couple of times he went in the slot. But almost every time he lined up left. And it wasn't like uh, DK Metcalf at Ole Miss where he was their boundary X, where he went to the, you know, the, the short side of the field mm. X. Uh, the, the Ayuk always went left, always, no matter what hash they were on. And he, I said, was that scheme? He said, yeah, it was just the way we did it. And their quarterback, to, you know, just wasn't very good. I think they had a freshman quarterback. He's 18-year-old, yeah. yeah. He was yeah he just wasn't, freshman I mean, quarterback, so freshman offensive line. That level. So, you know, so Kyle likes, he loves Ayuk, and we'll see. I mean, the ultimate thing when you look back on this is they, they wanted Kinlaw. They moved down a spot, took him at 14. They used the extra draft capital, the extra pick to, you know, get Trent Williams and also to move up. From 31 yeah, to 25. I think time will tell. I'm not going to evaluate. They got the guys they wanted. So you evaluate, you know, you go through it all, and you know, you've done this for a living. They, they comb over all these guys. And, you know, I may like a guy differently than, than Guy may, it may be different than you. And, but you go get the guy you want, and you're able to use the draft board to do that. They got the guys they wanted in the right spots they wanted. So that's what, that's what they wanted. Now, ultimately, five, ten years down the road, we're going to evaluate. Did they pass on Jerry Judy? Did they pass on Jerry Rice to go get Brandon Ayuk? 
you know, who knows? Uh, right. right. Judy could be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He could break all the records, be incredible. They, you know, they, they could have taken C.D. Lamb, but they also evaluated very high. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, they executed what they wanted to execute, and now it's up. To, and the, the, the beauty of Kyle's situation, he coaches these guys as well. It's not like a yeah. GM made the call and then said, go coach this guy, and I'm going to fire you. He's going to be put in a position as a play designer, play caller, to be able to get the best out of his athletes. So he got the guys that he wanted. And that's, that's obviously step one in the process. Well, Greg, we have uh, 15 more questions for you. So just hang tight. Is that all? <laughs> I'm going I'm to have to go over to the Gotham club and get a, uh, <laughs> a we'll, we'll send a, we'll send a driver. <laughs> Did you sign your own Jersey in the background there? For those of you listening. <laughs> that is? Yes. Well, that's that good. Is. Well, that the 49ers gave me that. Uh, so the Papa Five, not for my five, it's actually tilted a little bit. We want the other earthquakes as we were talking. But I, uh, this is something I talked about with Bob Sargent when I took the job. So I'm the first in the Bay Area to work for, and the Sharks are a great franchise, obviously, but they're somewhat younger than the others, to work for the Big Five, as they call it. Um, the, the two baseball teams, the Warriors, and now two, both football teams. So, and, and a, lot, a lot of people have done both baseball teams. You know, I'm the first one to do both football teams. Now, th this is a great distinction that I'm proud of, but I also, it also means I was fired from <laughs> three of those five. Teams. So, uh, but everybody signed it. John Lynch with the bit. John Lynch did the John Hancock on top. See how big that was? Oh, yeah. You went all the way down to five. Kyle was quicker. Uh, <laughs> you got Tim Ryan, Brent Show, Val Guido, Jed York, and Bob Sarge. I think it's all there. So yeah, that's a uh, pop of pop of five fired by three of the five. So. <laughs> well, you're one for one, one year with the Niners, one Super Bowl appearance, you know, see if you yeah, keep that rolling. It would have been nice to get uh, those last seven, 13 off the clock and win the game, but that's what this year will be for, right? If we ever, yep. if we play. So how are you guys doing? You look good. We're you hanging in there, you know, just chugging along. You look, chugging you look along. Pity guy. Have you lost weight a little bit during the quarantine? You look I don't know. I've, you know, I've probably lost, uh, I don't know that I've lost weight. This might be the angle of the camera here. I feel like I've probably gained a few. You the, have? Key is, the key is to I go vertical, the vertical on the camera. It makes the face look thinner. Well, I haven't worked out in three. I've lost muscle mass probably the same way, added a little bit of blubber, you know. When's well, the last you time like you put on, when's the last time you guys put on normal pants? Uh, March 10th. <laughs> March 10th. I have not worn <laughs> pants. I have not worn pants. Since my last Warrior show we did in studio. So I'm not wearing pants, no. Well, good thing is they're probably not going to come back, so you don't have to wear pants for a while. <laughs> yeah. You think so? You I got time on your side. I think it's shorts and sweats the rest of the time. I think we'll just do it that way. You don't see very much. No, you know? I, I, like, I, like, I like that idea. Maybe, you'll, like start just, from, oh, may, just, maybe you'll just do your job from now on from home. I mean, well, everything. I think, I've been doing the radio show from here for years. <laughs> and everybody got on me about it. Now it's going to be like, don't ever come back in again. So you were, ahead, you were the head of these time. You know, the key thing is, well, uh, I think the Giants may have to do this. John Miller was talking on the radio with us last week that they're not going to be able to travel. Yeah. So for road games, they're going to do them from, I don't know where. I'm I was – I was telling John earlier, Greg, that I was talking to a buddy of mine at ESPN who calls games, and he was telling me he thinks they're going to call games like some like they're doing for the KBO from home for some people. Now, I think that's workable for a television broadcast. For a radio broadcast, that's really hard. It would be difficult. That's so where you need the two pieces of wood you clap together for the crack of the bat. Yeah, I hope we don't go with the phony crowd noise. I don't think we need to do that. I'm hoping football broadcast embrace. Don't you want to hear, you know, Fred Warner checking – to a, from a, one defense to the other, yeah. based on what Russell – I think this is the opportunity to go inside the game and to be able to hear more than we've ever heard. Why do we want to put some fraudulent crowd noise when – our job as reporters, and, guy, you know, you do this for a living at the highest level, is to be is report what's going on. There's nobody there. Be so Belichick, what, Belichick agrees with your idea. Mic them all up. Let them listen to everything. Belichick does? I, yeah. No, I'm saying he would love that. He would be. Well, but he'd have people also, fucking taking notes on every team well, in the league. We're also going to do what Dante Hightower's check and do on his team as well. Yeah, yeah well, he'd have dummy. He, he, he'd be all over that one. Would that be fascinating? I hope It'd they – I, I mean, there's a, I think there's a way 
to cover sports more interestingly than we ever have before. So I think, uh, you know, you're not going to, and I love the, you know, I'm the one guy who watched every single Pro Bowl. And the main reason was I wanted to hear Andy Reid because he always lost the championship game, so he had a coach in the Pro Bowl. <laughs> but I, I wanted to hear Andy's terminology for how he called the play. To hear that, I'm sure he dubbed it down for a Pro Bowl. But I think, you know, you would never hear, like, Kyle call it a play. But wouldn't that be fun yeah. to be able to hear, like, the quarterback be able to – not just Omaha, Omaha, the quarterbacks we hear. But have you ever heard a defensive player when they're, you know, checking out of the defense and changing it all, what they're actually saying? You can't hear it because the crowd gets too loud. Would you watch the golf thing on Sunday with those guys? I, yeah, I did. Well, I did. They had a couple of moments where Phil described a chip, and you're like, what's he – he's talking about the colors of the grass, and it was incredible. It was yeah, my guy Brian Anderson did did that, and I think that was the that event was you had these four mega stars yeah. who have very different personalities. You know, Peyton's like he thinks everything's an episode of uh, detail or <laughs> Peyton's place. It's like Peyton, yeah. can you be quiet a little bit here and break? Phil, Phil Phil's the same way; he never shuts up. Yeah, Tiger never I, talks. It's also a good example because it's outside. Right. Even without crowd, there is just some ambi. Like I think football will have. There's some. Basketball is where it will, would sound pretty well, sterile, I think. Well, wouldn't you want to hear Draymond Green calling out a pick? Well, you know, that, he'd, be call, he'd be calling out a lot, a lot oh, of other yeah. words. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Everything would be MF, MF, MF. So, anyway, yeah, I, uh, I, I hope we embrace the new. Why do we want to pump in artificial crowd noise? That's so, I don't know. Are they doing that in the German soccer league? I think they're. I think they're doing that. That's a, a hell of a question that I don't know. The I only. I usually watch a mute. So watch German soccer. What the hell? I'm watching it all. KBO. I don't think they are. I'm gonna. Can I ask one more question? Do you believe Michael's story about the pizza, or do you think there are some other nefarious actions going on? Drinking or food poisoning? Yeah. Michael didn't drink. He didn't drink that. He's drinking now. He didn't drink. He gambled and hung out. Smoke. You don't think he was a big uh, drinker during in the nineties? No, I, I think he talked about it. No, I don't No, I never heard. I mean, Barkley was, and I was out with him many nights. I mean, but Barkley drank beer. Like, dude, go, go smoke a joint. You know, if Robert <laughs> Parrish is going to play till he's 42. He's not drinking beer. Uh, so, Charlie, you know, some guys drank. Most NBA players didn't drink. Charles Barkley did, at least with the Sixers. I think when he went to Phoenix, he got in better shape. Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't think Michael was necessarily drinking. Uh, I never heard about the food poisoning. I've been food poisoned in my life, and that is by far the most. Uh, I was sick for ten days. Just ten, day, ten days. Ten days. I was when I was young. I think it was my first year in the NBA. I went home. It was a break in my schedule. I went to a Buffalo Sabers hockey game with all my buddies I grew up with, and it was like late at night, drinking beer on the street. I got like a sausage from a vendor, and I I was I had food poisoning. And the Buffalo Bills, you know how sick I was? The Bills were playing a playoff game. That's why I went home for that game. There was no way I could go. And you know that I had to be on my deathbed. I mean, I, I sweat. I, I probably lost 15 pounds just sweating. I had salmonella. It was bad. So oh. there's varying degrees of food poisoning. I don't know if Michael had it that bad. And obviously, you know, my mom was making chicken soup or something to get me healthy where the Bulls had their trainers around yeah. the clock, you know, z packing them and probably shooting them up and trying to get – but he was – I never heard it was food poisoning, ever. It was uh, – The flu. You know, Marv, despite the flu, when he was, you know, obviously <laughs> so sick on the bench. But I never heard – no, but I believe that. I, I believe people. I don't – there's no reason to lie about it. You know, I don't, I don't think he was out drinking in the finals. No, I, you know, I don't even think Michael drank, you know, much when he played, if at all. But no, I you know I never knew to the extent of it. But it's and there's a lot of guys that like to go out and get get completely hammered drunk the night before a game. There was a guy I knew in the minor leagues, and his theory he'd go out. Now he went out every night and got drunk, but he would take me out drinking with him and he would get hammered. The guy said Mark Bombback, a pitcher, and his theory was what when you're tongue over the day that day, like you're in bed all day, you're starting pitcher, you know, three in the afternoon, four around five o'clock, you start feeling normal. And by seven o'clock, it's like you got your energy back. You know, you go out now. I feel good. I got all that out of my brain. I feel great. I can unleash the world. So everybody had a different theory on that. But I don't. I don't think he ever. Uh, no, I, I believe him. I believe it was the the pizza, bad pizza. Don't you don't you don't think so? Well, I mean, it just. I mean, I don't know. I I, I just think Mike. You just never know with Michael. 
Yeah, as you can see, he's already taken some liberties. He's like, yeah, I didn't care about Isaiah. And then Jack McCollum's like, yeah, I got it on tape. He said, no, Isaiah Thomas. No, you he- know, Mike, Mike, Mike kind of, uh, you know, just put the uh, documentary, his slant on every angle. Yeah, but I, Isaiah was not well-liked. I didn't well, like uh, no, of course. Isaiah was completely disingenuous. He wouldn't get He's, like, he's a, little, a lot like Alex Rodriguez when A-Rod played. Because he's he got would, the big he, smile. You want to believe him. You're like, he would, like, turn his back on you. And so you started asking the question, and when you were done, he would turn. And Mary Lou Retton was like that, too. You know, just, just – <laughs> Completely disingenuous. But anyway, take a shot to uh, Mary Lou. Isaiah, the one thing they never got into with Isaiah, with the Michael, Isaiah orchestrated that freeze out of Michael during Michael's rookie year. For the All Star game. Yeah. That's what it was. I think that's what my Michael was. But Bird and Magic knew how good he was. It was like, what are we going to do? This guy's yeah. better. But he showed up at the first All Star game in like this black and red. It wasn't even Bulls colors. He, like, had this – I'm sure it was a Nike sweat outfit that everybody was like, who is this guy? Well, he had the power of, you know, a, a burgeoning Phil Knight uh, and that whole thing. So Isaiah orchestrated that that freeze out of Michael at the All-Star game where, you know, as a rookie trying to assimilate with all these superstar players, I'm sure Michael felt ostracized. So I think they never got into that, but that's what I recall that relationship starting out. I see, and it was Isaiah that choreographed that whole thing. Makes sense. Greg, well, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Pizza. <laughs> yeah. No such thing. No, no such I thing. agree. Take it easy. Yeah, when it's bad, it's still good. That's it. That's We're right. done. We're done. I'm gonna go to the Gotham Club. I have in my dining room now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you. I'll zoom you for mine. <laughs> I have a speakeasy. I have to hit the door. <laughs> and just like a regular bar, you don't pay for a drink. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, he pays for all those ones. And oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks, Greg. You guys. You look good. Good Stay seeing you. See Same Later. to you.